you're around, you're watching directors, right. you're interested in it, and there's a job you take on a TV show, and you think, well, this probably won't get in the way of me going to film school. Right. Because what TV show lasts more than a pilot right, or right. a first season? Sure, right. It's a... And so you sign up for Happy Days. Correct. You <laughs> idiot. <laughs> uh, which, now, now, I mean, I mostly know uh, Andy Griffith's show, Mayberry RFD, from reruns because I really come of age in the 70s. Mm -hmm. The thing is Happy Days. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's, the, it's suddenly the only show on TV that we all watch. Right. And you're just right there at the heart of this thing, this juggernaut. And it was not the plan, right? No, it wasn't really the plan. Uh, and, and, and also, of course, the, the course of the show, it evolved, you know, as, 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 as Henry Winkler's character, Fonzie, took off. Right. You know, the whole show shifted. It was pretty thrilling to be around it. Uh, uh, and we went from a solid show to sort of drifting, like, bet we get canceled, to... Let's let's put Fonzie front and center mm -hmm. and take advantage of this. And then we cr we cr I think I think we became a number one show even that first season that we yeah. that we went in front of an audience, which was a huge education for me because I'd never done anything in front of people. And here we have this Gary Marshall, this great bunch of writers, Lowell Gans among them, who wound up writing with his partner Bob Lou Mandel, you know, Everything. Night Shift and Splash yeah, yeah. and all and and so many other movies, uh, League of Their Own and 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 uh, City Slickers. Anyway, but. It, suddenly it was about these hard laughs and that I had never really been around that search. You know, uh, Don Knotts would sometimes get there, but it was a more of a, it was a gentle, sure. you know, totally based on, on reality. I was terrified doing it, but I learned so much. And I, and Jerry Paris was this consummate comedy director. The, the, the Nate, just, uh, just educate film nerds out, I mean, TV nerds out there. Jerry Paris was uh, the neighbor on uh, Andrew Griffith's show. I mean, on, the, on, on, on Dick, Dick Van Dyke. On right. Dick Van Dyke, yeah. And they, and they had let him direct and yeah. found that he had this incredible gift. And he was a funny actor, but he was a brilliant comedy director. And we had him for almost 95% of our episodes was, was Jerry. And he was a ringleader and, and just tremendous and a great teacher. And, uh, and, and suddenly, you know, I'm feeling the audience and I'm understanding timing and all these kinds of things in a way that I never did before. Of course, Henry, great stage actor, Tom Bosley was on the show, yeah. you know. And uh, um, when I finally get a chance to start directing comedy, where we are going for laughs, which is Night Shift and then Splash, I was so grateful to have in my head the kind of the rhythms that I'd learned about, not from the Andy Griffith show, but from Happy Days. So the first time I saw it on Happy was on Happy Days, and then you later on saw it more and more, but characters would enter. And, you know, first season of Happy Days, I remember, was single camera. Right. And, and shot more uh, in, in this very filmic way. And then second season, you're in front of a studio audience, and then the show is becoming super popular, crazy popular. And so characters will enter. And the audience will go crazy. Right. And so characters had to, they're, they're entering with important information. Like there's a fire across the street. <laughs> yeah. So, Ron, you'll enter, you'll enter the, you know, whatever, the, the malt shop, and you'll be like, hey, hey, and everyone will go like, yay! And you'll stand there. <laughs> right, just take a pause. Because you can't talk, and you'll nod and look around, and then you'll go, and then what's finally, when everyone dies down, uh, there's a fire across the street, and if you take the reality of it, there's something. You're like a sociopath. Like, <laughs> why didn't you tell everybody right away? But there's waiting, a fire. I'm waiting for my applause, man. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it, that was it. I mean, look, that, that, that was part of the excitement was yeah. to take the all, you know all all the the hysteria around Fonzie. Yes. Yeah. And put it in front of an audience, yeah. and you know, and actually directly compete with J.J. Uh, Walker. Yeah, uh, uh, exactly. That, which is which is good what, times. Yeah, it, it, good times. And that's what they were. That's what they were going for. And uh, and you know the same thing would happen with JJ on that show. Yeah. And and so it was kind of a it was kind of a it was kind of a thing. Now I, you know I don't know I'm I don't I'm not watching a lot of audience sitcoms these days, but I don't know whether I think most people they don't even shoot with an audience. I think they no, just it's, they block and shoot. I think we're in a golden age. I. Mm. Sometimes people decry, oh, TV these days. And I, I, think, I agree. You know, you were talking about speed and density yeah. of comedy and so forth. And when, when we when when we were beginning Arrested Development, mm -hmm. Mitch Hurwitz and I talked a lot about The Simpsons. 
And part of that style was to create, I kept, I kept saying a kind of density of laughs. Yeah. And, and, uh, I was a big proponent of that. And, um, which kind of led to not only the, the, the style, which was sort of supposed to be originally much, a little more faux documentary than it wound up being. But, um, you know, I was pitching the idea of a narrator mm -hmm. and Mitch said, I don't think we're going to need that. And we did it and so forth, you know, and he just, he, he shot it and it was funny, but he said, you know, we should try it as an experiment. I kind of think you're onto something. So I was, I was directing a movie in Santa Fe and he said, would you just temp in the voice? And I, so I did it literally in the sound truck. We were on location in Santa Fe. I did it one lunch break for the pilot. Right. And so sent it off. Didn't think much about it. A couple of days later, Mitch called back and said, uh, well, I have, I have really good news and news that maybe is good or maybe not. I don't know. And I said, well, okay, well, give me the really good news first. He said, the pilot tested really well. Yeah. And I, I said, well, what's the, what's the mixed news? He said, well, I just don't know how you're going to feel about it because uh, the narrator tested the highest and now you have to do it. <laughs> we sold the show, but I said you're doing it. You're the narrator. But, you know, uh, uh, but I loved being part of that. You know, it makes sense because uh, my son and I watch, rewatch, rewatch, and rewatch Arrested Development all the time because uh, he's got really good comedy taste. I'm not so much to his liking, but he, <laughs> he's, but uh, we'll watch it again and again and again. And what makes perfect sense to me, you know, when something's done, you just take it for granted that everything is the way it is. Right. So of course it would never occur to me that you wouldn't be the narrator of Arrested Development. And I think for my money, if you had to say like, okay, there's, what are the, what are the, the absolute acme, what's the height of television comedy? And you can, not one, but you can pick like five. Arrested Development's in there. Oh, well, thank the you. best of it is absolute perfection. And uh, I do think that people know you, they like you, and they trust you. And you, your voice saying, meanwhile, Buster, uh, <laughs> Buster had his own ideas, okay. you know, and, and, and it's such a dense show, right. you know, Buster thinking he's in Mexico, although really he's only 10 miles from his house, <laughs> sleeping at his housekeeper's residence. Oh, you know, it's a constant, you're being taken by the hand <laughs> right. through this absolute madness. And uh, I don't think that show could exist without you there taking it, you along. Thank you. It was really fun. But whenever, whenever I'd have an episode where I, I really had a lot of lines, I said, Mitch, you've been, you've been, you've been, you've been struggling with this one. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking for the narrator to bail you out, man. <laughs> now, the reason that was funny <laughs> is because <laughs> when you found yourself reading lines like that. But Mitch, uh, bona fide comedy genius. Yes. And, and that, yeah. uh, you know, the, and the cast that we assembled oh from, God. from the first moment, it was like, you know, uh, th this is this is a, a little too good to be true. I mean, it's just home run hitters at every you know at every turn. Yeah, it is absolute. Uh, it is absolute perfection. I can't watch it enough, and it's still the go to. If my son's had a hard day, or I've had a hard day, or we've both had a hard day, we'll okay. Arrested Development is still the go to. Cool, and we watch it. And there are certain moments uh, that, uh, I go to again and again and again that I can't, and I'm friends with a bunch of these guys. So uh, I sure. will, I will corner, uh, Will Arnett and yeah. say, why does it bother you if you're dancing as the magician, but Buster's dancing as well? <laughs> what <laughs> bothers you that, because he's often getting like, no, 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 I do that. And, but I, I'll just hound him all the time about that stuff. And he's got answers. Yes, he's got answers. <laughs>